welcome to the Film Mechanic Screenwriting Podcast with Derry Titan. Hey, this is Derry Titan with the Screenwriting Podcast, and I just wanted to welcome y'all today to step in to this arena, like uh, gurus say, step into the arena. And today we have none other than Lee House with us. And today I want you to get familiar with his work. Lee, real quick, how you doing today, Lee? I'm doing great, man. Happy to be on the podcast. Happy to uh, talk with my man, Derry. And, uh, you know, it's just good to be here. Man, we and we are truly, truly appreciative of having you today. And um, so, Lee, as we always get started, you know, I just want to give us a rundown on who Lee House is. Well, I'm going to give you the whole story like I do when I have what's called general meetings where I get to meet uh, network execs and studio execs. And uh, for me, you know, uh, I grew up in North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and I realized that I liked comedy going to public school, riding the bus. Because anybody that rode the bus in public school knows, like, if you ain't got the right thing on or if your mom comes out with rollers in her hair or whatever, cats start to snap and joke. And I realized quickly I couldn't beat everybody on the bus, so I had to joke back. And that's kind of where I saw the power of comedy. It's like, oh, wow, I'm this little kid on the bus, but because I can joke back, now I'm popular on the bus. Then as I get older, the jokes started helping me meet ladies and all that. And I knew early on that I wanted to do something with comedy, but I didn't know too much about writing or stand-up comedy or any of that. So I graduated from high school. I went to Hampton University. Uh, After Hampton University, a friend of mine named Gerald Crippens, much love for Gerald Crippens, he told me to come out to California. Uh, He was like, man, give it a shot. You'll love it out here. You know, so I did. I was sold in a week, you know, after coming out here, seeing the nice cars, the, uh, you know, everything else that is beautiful out here. You know, I was sold. And believe it or not, my first job when I got to L.A. was working with Lynch Mob Records. Gerald worked there and that's Ice Cube's old label that he owned with his wife and so I went up there and I was stuffing envelopes the 12 inch records that we used to send out to DJs back in the day I was doing that and here's a funny story my career in entertainment got started truthfully because Cube and I used to play this video game uh it was, it was the popular basketball game at the time NBA Live one of them I can't remember from way back okay. in the day he okay. couldn't beat me and so we would play this video game every day and we became cool. And within six months of being in LA, I'm working at Lynch Mob Records and I'm on tour with Ice Cube. So that's how I jumped into the game, you know? After that, I uh, worked in music for about two to three years. I saw that, you know, I wasn't necessarily cut out for gangster rap on the West Coast. And so I started PA, production assistant, on various things. I got involved in television that way. Next thing you know, Flex, who's actually my cousin, gets one-on-one. Flex and I had always collaborated with jokes. He knew I always wanted to do something in the business, and he was able to get me an internship with the WGA on his show. Which Flex, so people know? Flex Alexander, who was the star of one-on-one many years ago, uh, because it's not Funkmaster Flex, who a lot of people think, and then there's other Flexes, but this is Flex Alexander, the uh, handsome comic who uh, had one-on-one for many years, and we're still pitching shows, you know, hopefully we'll have another one soon. Oh, man, listen, all you got to do, that's all it, that's all this is, is the hustle of being, you know, right place, right time, right person to hear it, the thing I've noticed about Hollywood is, is, you know, meetings are everything. However you can get a meeting, as soon as you get in front of somebody, you got to sell. It's kind of like being a car salesman. And when you're early in your career, you know, you're trying to sell that Volkswagen Beetle with a dent in it. So you got to, you know, <laughs> you got to pitch and sell and make that car, which is you, seem like it will be the hottest car in the world. You know, you get that little dent out, you put some wax on it, you can do this. You got to figure out a way to make yourself appealing, even though you may not have that much appeal at the time. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because that is one of the things of it is, is when I'm working with writers, I always try to, you know, I don't try to really like get too deep into 
telling them how to do something. But whenever they send me things, I always say, you have to sell it to me. And a lot of times they don't know how to sell. And that's, that's where you have to study the art of negotiation. You have to study how to, you know, uh, what salesmanship is, you know, is ev everywhere we go, right? Every store you walk in, shoe store, clothing store, somebody say, hey, how you doing today? You looking for anything particular? And it's that same pitch, you know, are you looking for anything particular? You know, so. I mean, it's, there's no right way to do it, uh, you know, and, and as a writer, in my mind, you know, because every writer's situation is different, everybody's opinion is different, and, and once again, there's no right way to make it, it's just, you know, however I say you can get a meeting, and then hopefully in that meeting you can sell somebody to say yes, you know, whether it's to get you on a show, to buy an article, you know, whatever it is, but the way I think you sell yourself as a writer is your one page or your treatment for your project has to be something that within like the first paragraph somebody says oh i want to see more from this person so even though you have to sell yourself verbally and physically you also have to sell yourself on the page and you know it's so many people trying to be writers you got to capture folks within the first you know two sentences or within the first minute you're talking you know it has to be quick how do you sell how would you sell yourself on a page in the first two sentences all right well um I'm trying to think of a project that I'm, I'm pitching a project right now. Um, it's uh, actually with CBS Studios and I hooked up with Devon Franklin's company. And the way that I was able to sell the project is truthfully, it was a personal story. And I basically talked about what my family went through. When my folks started making more money. We went from, you know, a uh, blue collar neighborhood or hood, whatever you want to call it, to a nicer neighborhood. And the passion with which I spoke about it and then talking about how basically the thing that sold them is even when you think you've made it, you haven't really made it because you got to get along with these new folks who are looking at you like, what you doing over here? And so you have to kind of spark an idea or some interest in yourself quickly, you know, and, and how you do it, you know, I, I don't know, you know, everybody has different ways of doing it, but that's the game. And if you start to focus on the sales aspect of it, everything else will come easier. But one thing you got to be ready for, things happen quickly in this business. So, you know, let's say you do sell yourself, you got to have something to show. So, you know, you got to be ready when you sell, because I mean, it may happen like that moment, like in the music business, for instance, uh, one of the things I used to have to do on the road with uh, Lynch Mob is you know, truthfully, nobody wanted to listen to artists in Kansas City who were trying to make it, you know, so I would get sent out to do that type of stuff. And, you know, a lot of times when people are listening to you, they're tired or they, they get ready to go. So you got to, you know, like in the music business, you had to, within the first five seconds, you know, you better have something that's hot, that's appealing. And it's the same with writing, you know, I can't necessarily tell you how to do it. But even if you start out with a few curse words, like you said, shit, this is crazy that is going to make a person read more. I don't suggest that, but that's just an example of, you know, shock value is one way you can do it, but however you do it, be creative. And remember, you got to engage people quickly. That's the game. That is the game, engaging people. And, and, and then after you engage, like your story has to continuously stay engaged, engaging. And that's what I mean by being ready. You know, like somebody might be like, okay, well, what you got? And then if you don't have anything, that moment's over, but you got to be prepared. And, you know, a lot of times you don't necessarily need a script. You just need a hot treatment. That'll buy you some time. You say, oh, well, I got this. And if the treatment's hot, they're like, well, can I see a script? That's when you can kind of get in hustle mode. You might be able to negotiate, pay for a script, or you'll at least have some time to write. But you got to engage folks quick. And a lot of times, a lot of up and coming writers think it's all about the script. It's not really. It's all about the kind of uh, the hype you know, and the hype is your treatment or your pitch pages or you in a meeting, you know, you better, you, you, unfortunately you can't be boring. And it sucks that writers sometimes have to be actors, but if you want to make it in the biz and not write books, that's part of it, man, the showmanship. How do you deal with the nose though, Lee, with, with the, with the passings? Like there, you know, there's, there's recommendations, considerations and passings. So how do you deal with the passings? 
Well, first off, I just want to say to everybody that that Steven Spielberg, Flex, uh, you name it, even Will Smith, you know, everybody gets mainly knows, you know, that's part of it. The way that I deal with it, you know, it, it, it definitely hurts. Um, I just find something else or find another way to pitch it. But like, truthfully, on my computer, there's probably 30 to 40 different ideas that I have out there. So if I get a no on something, I move on to something else. You know, you just got to keep reinventing yourself and you got to have tough skin to be in this business. Because here's the thing. Let's say you do get on a show after like 30 no's. When you get on that show, when you're pitching jokes, the overwhelming majority of your pitches, they're going to tell you no in your face. Like, oh, no, that's not going to go on the strip. Or, oh, no, that one. So it's a business of dealing with the no's. You know what I mean? And, you know, there's no perfect way to deal with it other than to move on to something else. Or like I said, if you're working on a show or pitching ideas in a, in a movie think tank, you just got to have another idea. You just keep moving forward. That's from what I've seen in this business, you know, it, it doesn't slow up for any sensitivity <laughs> at all. They don't give a damn. So just got to have something else lined up. Like I've seen people crying in writing rooms and <laughs> nobody comforted them. Like, you better ship up or they're going to ship your ass out, you know? So it's like, you know, you got to have thick skin or write novels you know what i mean you don't have to have as much thick skin there but you know you might be living with cats for 10 years where you get some money so <laughs> it's 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 tough it's it, it is look so all right so <laughs> not not that not they gotta have they in the writing room crying I, i've heard so many stories like that it's crazy so what what's a project lee that you you didn't get but you wish you had worked on that project. Man, there's a show that I pitched around town for like three years, man. Like Larry Wilmore almost bought it. Uh, Regina King and them almost bought it. And I thought it was like the best project in the world. It's called Black Brit. And it's about a brother similar to me and you, Derry, who's an intelligent guy, uh, who's a handsome guy, <laughs> who... Uh, seemingly has it going on but he hits rock bottom he can't figure out what it is and so he says to himself you know what i might be more attractive if i started acting like i was british so he dons the british accent he's able to get a job he's able to change his life get the girl of his dreams so he's living life on the high end finally but he's living a lie and i thought that that show everybody would just love it would clamor to it because you know the humor is right there and it touches on something bigger. How can a brother like me or you, Derry, be fine, you know, or, or be okay because we speak different? Like, 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 how come speaking as an American doesn't make you special, but if I speak as if I'm British, I'm just all of a sudden something else. And so the show was about how an accent can take a person to the next level, which was really a deeper look at how we, not just uh, Black folks, but how everyone looks at Black men. And why being an African American just isn't good enough. And, you know, people got it immediately, all that. And the thing that it ultimately came down to is most of the networks didn't think that the show could do like 100 episodes. And of course, I had pitches and counters and whatnot, but that's the one that I still, and I'm still pitching it to this day, but that's the one that I just didn't understand. Like, man, this would be hilarious. And I said it in the South where accents are real big, you know what I'm saying? And they haven't come across too many Black British people. So, you know, that's the one that uh, still bugs me. Yeah, I man. And it's so funny because what's funny about that is, is language. I had a discussion the other day and I was saying, and I'm not, I don't want to get serious here, but I did have this, this discussion the other day and I was saying, in a Black community, one of the things that we kind of, we missed out on our good opportunity is we don't understand Mandarin. We don't understand Yiddish. We don't understand um, Arabic. And these are actual people that work in our community. And if you walk in the store and you speak in the language of the store owner, how, do, how does that relate to each other, right? How, why does language automatically bring you something else? You know what I'm saying? Like language, like, so I get, I get it. I get it. I, I, I do get it. Imagine speaking the language, somebody speaking the language to you and you speak back to them, or a Frenchman, you speak back in French. 
oh, you know, you know, or you know what I'm saying? Like they automatically get it. So it's like, you know how when, uh, you know, you went to HBCU. So when you hear a girl who's, who speak, uh, like she's from New Orleans, you know, she, New Orleans, you, 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 you like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, a girl who, you know, she from Germany and she has that, you know, heavy accent and you like, you know, even, you know, so. Yeah, and, that's, and that's what I was trying to play off of with Black Brit. And, and truthfully, the, the, the brother that uh, truly inspired it is a guy that I knew uh, when I was in between writing jobs, I had a gig with Remy Martin. And in this gig, uh, at the time, Remy was trying to uh, compete with Hennessy. So they started putting their bottles in hip hop videos. And my job was to figure out ways to incorporate the bottle for like just maybe five to 10 seconds. And, you know, uh, go and meet with the rappers and make sure that they would uh, put it in. And, you know, there were certain ways that the bottle couldn't be used. Like Remy didn't want you to be, you know, pouring it on yourself. So I had to make sure I was doing all of that, you know? And, and I forgot where I was headed with this point, but- um, No, the, the brother that inspired the Black Brit. The brother that inspired me, he was the guy, he was, he was a British brother. And he was the guy that would find the artist for us at Remy. And he and I started hanging out. And whenever we would kick it in Los Angeles, as soon as this brother, we looked the same, you know, dressed the same, as soon as he would open up his mouth, it's like a spotlight shone on him. And I got pushed into the background. And I saw this dynamic with black folks, with, with white folks, with Asians, whatever. And I'm like, man, this is a show. This, this has got to work. Cause like, I see it happening. And it was funny because this brother thought, you know, no, they like me, man. And I'm like, no, they like your accent, man, you're different. But that was what kind of launched the idea. And then when I started seeing Idris Elba blow up the way he was and all these other British actors getting jobs and Sam Jackson started speaking out about it, I'm like, we got something here. Because obviously the execs are thinking that these British brothers are, uh, we'll just say better for whatever reason. You know, it's something about that accent. It's powerful. It makes you uh, better than an African-American. And so that's kind of what spawned the idea. And, you know, I had bright eyes at the time. I was thinking, oh, man, I'm going to start this big discussion, man. This show's going to be the bomb. Mm -hmm. That shit ain't sold yet. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that hurts me. But, you know, we were talking earlier in this conversation about dealing with the no's. Yeah. I just moved on to other projects. I pitch other stuff. That's what it's, that's what it's about. And, 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 the, and that's one of the things. So, you know, even though we have, you have a moment where, you know, those things, you know, that show Black Brit didn't, you know, see the light as of yet, as of yet. I like what's that. What's the most proudest moment of your writing career? You know, it's pretty basic for me. It was literally the first, my first episode of One on One happened uh, the first year I was there. I got like maybe the 13th or 15th episode of a 22 episode order back in the day when writers were making real money, you know, when you would be on a show like eight months. But that night, um, first, let me explain. One-on-one -on, -one on tape nights, it used to be a who's who of Black Hollywood. Uh, I mean, at, at the time, uh, one of the years, Kim Kardashian was dating Ray J. So you saw all of those folks, uh, all of the popular rappers at the time. So it was a big thing. We used to have drinks on stage. I mean, it was a really big party moment. So when I finally had my first script, you know, it was big, you know, uh, and all the other writers gave me champagne and made a big deal out of it. So that was the most special night. Like, I, you know, I went off to the side and dropped a tear, started thinking about my grandma and all the old stuff, you know, like, how did I made it? You know what I'm saying? All that type of stuff. So that, that's what, what sticks because after that, it became a grind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then all that shit weighed quick because like like we were talking about in this conversation about the nose, I probably got a thousand no's since then. But that first tape night and and one on one and flex and uh, the late Unetta Boone, who was the uh, showrunner, man, the, the, those were the times for me. That one I almost get teared up talking about it now because that first night, my first episode was taped on the Paramount lot was my biggest night. So when you first come to LA, like, what did you learn? Like in terms of like learning everything that there is to learn, not just about the business, but what are some of the things that you've learned then to now that you carry with you everywhere? Like what's your gold? What's that nugget of wisdom that you carry with you on your screenwriting journey? You gotta have thick skin. 
because I mean, I'm sure you can imagine the environment in there. You know, you can't even in entertainment at any level, you can't be soft. You can't be sensitive. Not everybody is going to like your stuff. So continuing to reinvent yourself and find your next project is the thing I learned. And in the music business, not every song is going to hit. You know what I'm saying? Not every artist is going to hit. So you keep making music and you keep finding new artists. And I learned quickly, you know, with writing, not every idea is going to hit. Uh, like I've been trying to sell a movie since I've been writing uh, for the last 15 years. And I still haven't sold one yet. You know what I'm saying? But you keep pushing. You just find another project or you move into television or into podcast or whatever, you know, uh, so the one nugget that I would give in terms of uh, just personal being is get thick skin, don't be sensitive. And if you are, don't let nobody know. You can cry off to yourself, you know what I'm saying? Just don't let them see it. But, you know, that, that's, that's one of the pieces of wisdom I could give. Lee, I thank you one time, man. You know what I'm saying? I think, I think that is, and I know you on social media, so... You know, it's so funny because you don't pose. You might glance at it. I could tell if you're glancing at it every now and then. Um, but when and, you and that's wrong. I I'm doing social media wrong. I'm just I'm, I may not look it. I'm old. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm old school, and 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 that is wrong. So if you are an up and coming writer and listening, yo, get your social media brand together. Get some stuff out there. Do like Mr. Derry is doing, have a social media brand, because when you do get attention or when you do get one of those meetings, like I was talking about earlier in the podcast, the more you have to show, the better, because what these execs, here's the deal. These execs have great jobs that they don't want to lose. So they want sure things. You know what I mean? You know, these people are making 200 to $500,000. So they want sure things when they bring in writers and whatnot. And a lot of times just having something on the page isn't enough. And let's be honest, a lot of times people that are reading your scripts and reading your stuff, they're reading it real quick. A lot of times they don't know what they're doing. You know what I mean? So anything that you have to show who you are, which is best done on social media, it helps. Because I'm a firm believer. It only take one, right? That's and, it. And look, the one that you get when, when they present you out into the world, then the world started to go back and see everything you did that led up to that moment. Like, what else do they have? What else have they been a part of? What else have they done? Who are these? And they go, they, they start digging deep into like, ye, like your years. So it's like, I look at content sometimes and, and I'll see people two years ago, like doing stuff. And I'm like, wow, like they've been doing this for a minute. This is not new. So when it's presented to the world, the first thing most people do is they start looking to see what have you done? What else can they connect to you? So, and, and also almost every writer that's ever made it, especially when you make it big, people will go and buy your old projects. Uh, like a good friend of mine, Ed Grapevine Fordham, he, uh, we used to work together on UPN. He's also Flex's cousin. And um, he used to be on one-on-one. -on -one. And I remember he got on a CBS show years ago called Battle Creek. And the guy who did it, I believe it was Vince Gilligan. This was a project he was trying to sell like 14 years ago and kept getting nosed. And then after uh, Breaking Bad did so well, you know, of course they were down to do like, what else you got? And so he was able to sell some of his old stuff and it's the same for every writer. So it, it may not seem, it, you may feel like you're spinning your wheels, but like you said, you know, when you do get that one yes, all your old stuff becomes viable again. So. You know, try not, to get, try not to get discouraged. And as we uh, spoke earlier, just keep moving on to different things. You know what I mean? Just just keep moving on. You never know what's going to hit. Yeah. Thanks, Lee, for stopping through the Film Mechanic Screenwriting Podcast today. We really appreciate you more than you will ever know. For everyone that's out there that if you do not have a copy of the Film Mechanic Screenwriting Workbook, please stop by my website, www.dairytitan.com. Get you a copy. Check out old podcast. We'll talk to y'all soon. Peace. We appreciate your support. Be sure to leave a review and a comment and share with your closest screenwriting friends. Stop by www.dairytitan.com for the Film Mechanic Screenwriting Workbook. 
and we'll see you next episode. Have an awesome, awesome, awesome day. Peace.